Okay, so the recording should be running. Welcome everyone to the machine learning lecture today. We will talk about now on neural networks, right? So this is the essential topic in artificial intelligence. I'm just wondering what kind of books do I have over here? Um, so for example, that one, which is like the Stuart Russell, an older version from Stuart Russell and AI. When you look at the book, Inside, there's also a chapter on learning in neural and belief networks. And that was always a chapter in an AI book, but it was a very thin one, okay? So the chapter on neural network always exists. So there was in AI always these connectionist people who like neural networks. However, um, recently they really, um, the amount of work in deep learning increased and it basically now is going through all, to most portions of the book are now somehow driven by neural networks and by deep learning. Maybe I'm a little bit exaggerating. However, in a classical book like on a artificial intelligence, there's a lot of logic, logical AI and all these things. And they are right now maybe a little bit less popular than the super popular deep learning stuff. And so the deep learning stuff is basically all this, uh, based on neural networks, okay? So neural networks equal deep learning. So that's basically the same thing, okay? It's just a more classical name, these neural networks. So to get started, here's again the overview. You've seen it so often, so let's get started quickly. So I'm following a particular book, the book from Chris Bishop here. It's called Neural Networks and Pattern Recognition. And it's from 1995, so interesting title. So at that point, neural networks were still quite popular. And so that made a nice title for pattern recognition, how to use neural networks. Then later on, Chris Bishop wrote a new book and that was more called um, Machine Learning for Pattern Recognition or Machine Learning and Pattern Recognition. So he kind of rephrased it um, because machine learning is more the popular term and maybe also his book was a bit wider than more the narrow view of neural networks. Right, also including other methods like support vector machine and kernel methods and all of this. However, the, his initial book on machine learning basically was a book on neural networks, okay? And we are um, coarsely following chapters three and four of the book. You don't have to read the book for following the lecture, but if you want to have a look at it and want to have um, the story told from Chris Bishop, you can also have a, look, have a look at the book. So why am I now following such an old book? Isn't it outdated? No, not at all. It gives us a very basic introduction to the simple principles behind neural network, okay? So the advantage here of being very old is that it's like very down to earth and I hope very easy to understand. And um, before going into lots of details with spec propagation and with modern deep learning, it really sticks to the basic and shows how from linear regression kind of, by reinterpreting it, we have neural networks, okay? So the short story is neural network is basically linear regression for computer scientists, or maybe linear regression stacked on top of each other for computer scientists, okay? So that's neural networks. And actually that's also deep learning. So what problem are we looking at? We're looking at the two category classification problem, okay? So that one, let me draw on the board as usual. So the two category classification problem looks like this. We have positive examples and we have some negative examples and we want to learn a classifier for this, okay? So we learned the large margin classifier which was drawing a, like a straight line with the maximum margin. But before the support vector machines, there were already other methods and linear regression or linear logistic regression, for example, are prominent examples that can also solve these kind of problems. Okay, so we just trying, in this case now, let's first start with trying to learn a straight line that is kind of nicely separating the data, but without a margin or with anything else. So this is much simpler than the support vector machine stuff. So let's look how to write it down. So we have some weights, vector W, yeah, that is multiplied with our location vector X. So X is some location vector on the board. It was like a two dimensional vector, but it could be a high dimensional vector. So the output will be a single scalar, okay? Plus some bias, okay? And then, this looks like a regression, right? And it is actually really a re regression. And we interpret it in such a way that if the value of this regression is greater than zero, we assign our example to class one, otherwise to class two. So far, so simple. So now how is this a neural network? Okay, so this is our first neural network, but how is this simple equation already now a neural network? So for this, 
let's draw a different image. Yeah, so these networks are always these kind of graphs. Um, so our neural network, what I said is W transpose X plus some W zero. Okay, I think that's a notation and we call it Y of X. So how is this equation in neural network? For this, let's say um, the X is in R to the five. Okay, that means that the W is also in R to the five. And for each of the component of the X, we draw here one node, okay? So we want to have a graph. So let's give each of these input coordinates like a little node. And now let's interpret this in a product, okay? So basically the output will be a scalar, okay? So it will be another node and who's involved? All of the axes are involved. So we draw these arrows here towards that one. And now where are the W's? The W's are basically now weights that we put onto these arrows, okay? So far so good. Then the next operation is that we are adding a bias, W0, okay? This is just with the plus and we get our next computation. And then this will be our output Y of X. So this is our first neural network. So the neural thing might be a bit surprising, right? But let's first say, so this is our first network. So what did we do? We just wrote out the computation up here as a graph, okay? And now the computation is going along the graph. So now where does the neural part come in? So this kind of looks like a, like a cell from your brain, right? Like a neuronal cell. So basically these neuronal cells, they are often drawn like this, like having a form like that. And then there's some, some axon and with uh, lots of inputs coming from, from other nodes and stuff, yeah? And then typically kind of, so there's coming some input and then here's some computation happening where the computation is basically some thresholding, right? Maybe waiting until enough current flew in and when it's thresholded, then the whole thing will fire and will also generate some signal. And in a way, this is a super simple mathematical model, right? However, <clears throat> we don't threshold here anything. We are just integrating everything. So integration like summation, we summing everything up, having a weighted sum, and then that's the output. So this is like the super simple, essential, yeah, a possible mathematical model for a really neuronal cell. And the first neural networks that were motivated from basically trying to understand the brain and looking at the brain of cats and of other animals, of, of rats, and trying to find out, so now, um, could we find a mathematical function that is describing what's happening in these brains? And like this is like a super simple starting point at the beginning. So this is our first neural network. Good. Um, not surprisingly, this is creating a linear decision boundary, right? I mean, as we know, this is a linear function up here. And basically now the space of all possible functions wt times x are all like defining us some straight lines. Yeah, so let's draw this again. So suppose <clears throat> we are asking, so this w times x being equal to zero, yeah, let's say in x1, x2 space. Yeah, so what kind of functions can I have? I can have all these functions that go through the origin. Now, if I add a w0, then we've seen that we then can also shift off all these straight lines and we can have arbitrarily straight lines in the plane. That's something that we learned from regression, right? So from regression, then we would take like orthogonal, the orthogonal um, component like the w and we would project everything onto it. And then like along the line, we get zero and to the left and to the right, we get positive or negative numbers. Now we take the positive and negative numbers to have a classification boundary by this, okay? So as often, like we want to have simple notation and we, of course, we would prefer to get rid of this bias term here. So we would like to write it like W transpose times X. And this typically can be done if you extend your data now with a little one. So that is often a convention that we assume that our data points X have an additional component, which is constant. And by that kind of, we could include this W zero in this bigger W vector. Yeah, so for our picture here, that would mean, okay, let's include a new component X zero, which is equal to one. It's always equal to one. And then we can just draw a W zero over there. And the whole thing got a little bit simpler. Okay, so we have Y of X. 
However, the expressivity is still the same because we can arbitrarily choose this offset over here. Okay, good, so far so good. This is just notation. So now what if we have several categories? So suppose we have lots of different classes. Could we also use something like this? And now we are getting slightly more fancy here. So instead of having a single discriminant function, I could also have for every class a different discriminant function. So that would be a three class problem where I'm having, for example, circles and classes and minus signs. And now how could I now use um, like linear functions to do these classification things? So for example, the solution would be I draw a line, a straight line that is kind of separating one class from the rest, okay? And here's another line which is splitting the pluses from the rest. And here's another line that is splitting the circles from the rest. And now if I want to have a new data point, let's say that one over here, so I don't know what this point is, then I would look on which sides of the plane it is and then I might decide so it's a circle. Of course, there are some uh, unmarked territory here where I'm kind of not sure what's going on. So it's not a perfect solution here. But it is a solution where the data is, ideally, okay? So now how would our image here change? Okay, we want to have three lines, okay? So let's say we have y1, y2 of x, and we also have y3 of x, okay? So we now have these three nodes. And uh, let's get rid of these labels over here, yeah? So for simplicity. And now basically I need to draw all these lines to each of them, okay? And now you also see that it's getting more an interesting network. However, this looks like a big mess, right? So now I could also add all these W's and index them with the second one. But of course, also here we are kind of efficient and we will just write W, okay? So that's more convenient. So by saying like the W, I'm not sure whether what notation I'm using here now. Yeah, I'm not even using it, but, but one could now include basically the the W over here. Oh, please tell me that I should switch to the board. So now you can see it better. So the W collects a W1, a W2, a W3. And now again, it's a question, do you want to have written it like that? Yeah, then you probably need to transpose these guys. Uh, maybe like this, transpose it outside. Yeah, then this notation would be fine. Or maybe I have the transpose over there. Then this notation is okay. Okay, and there you see it's just a linear transformation of my data to get like a three-dimensional representation and from the three-dimensional representation I can now look on which side of the planes I am, okay? Good, um, of course, what can we do about these kind of corner cases? If we take really decision boundaries and say, if you are positive, you're one class, if you're negative, you are one of the other class, that might be a bit strict Possibly we can catch most of these cases as well. Oops, by saying, so now calculate the distance to these planes, yeah? And then basically using these numbers. So the one that is smallest, so this one has the smallest distance. So you're probably one of these classes over there as well, right? So there are some tricks how you could also do it, um, uh, how, how you could also cover all the other areas. I mean, in principle, what we would like to have, it's like, again, like a Voronoi type of thing. And we will see that this also pops out of this one. Good. So we could have now a linear discriminant function for each of the classes. And then we would say if one is larger than everyone else, yeah, so we don't take as a decision boundary now the zero, but we compare with everyone else, then we will assign it to the corresponding class. And this turns out to split the whole space now into a Voronoi type of picture, okay? So basically it will turn the whole picture like this. So this is the area where basically the Y for the pluses is largest. This is the area where the Y for the, for the nodes is the largest, okay? And so on and so forth. Good. Um, now, when we compare these things here, yeah, we can now ask, is it really a linear decision boundary that we get? And that can be proven very briefly. So if I take the difference of two of them and now plug in the definitions, right? 
and then sort out the x and the constant terms, then I see that basically this being greater than zero or exactly being equal to zero will be the decision boundary, yeah? That is actually a linear function. So it is a straight function, okay? So basically by this discussion here, one can see that this will be a straight line if I'm following like the rule that if the function that is largest kind of wins, okay? It's not trivial that it turns out to be like that, but it is like that since we start with linear functions. So it creates linear decision boundaries and they are very similar to Voronoi cell or to high dimensional Voronoi cells, okay? Okay, next, let's generalize it now again for the two classes by now applying some nonlinear function to it, the so-called activation function, okay? And so this is going more towards logistic regression where we now applying some nonlinearity to the output of this. So the output of my linear function is the number from minus infinity to plus infinity. So maybe it's nice to create a number between zero and one, which we can interpret like probabilities, okay? So that's the point kind of, of applying now some activation function. I don't want to have arbitrary large or arbitrary small values. I want to squash them into a nice region, okay? So it doesn't change the decision, right? The ordering of my decisions won't be changed if the G is a monotonic function. However, it gets a nice interpretation if I have the right choices for G. So let's look at an example. So suppose we have like a two class problem and let me draw it on the board again. And let me not forget to switch to the board. So this is the board. And now let's get probabilistic. By the way, when you look at the papers from Chris Bishop, right? I mean, he likes Bayesian statistics a lot, right? So that's why he wants to motivate maybe the activation function now with the probabilistic reasoning. However, even if you're not a Bayesian or not a, stat a statistics person or probability lover, yeah, then also this should intrigue you that out of this discussion that I show you, the sigmoid function will pop out, okay? So if you ever wondered, in case you know this already, where does this logistic sigmoidal function comes from, yeah? Stay tuned, let's derive it with two Gaussians. So suppose now, our class problems with the pluses and the minus ones, suppose now we could model it with two Gaussian distributions, okay? Where both Gaussians are like circular Gaussians. So that means that now our covariance is, for ex as, let's assume for simplicity, it's the identity matrix. But the important thing here is that sigma one and sigma two are, are equal, okay? So that's important that they are equal. If they are equal, one can show that we have a linear decision boundary, as we will see in a second. And I think we've seen it already last time. Um, now, the other description, that, the other point that I need for describing these um, two Gaussians are the means. So here's mu1 and here's the mu2, okay? So those are the descriptions. And now, um, given that I know in what class I am, okay? So let's flip to the slide. Yeah, I can write down the density to be just this usual multivariate Gaussian distribution, okay? So given that I know I'm in a particular class, in class K, I can pick the correct mean and I can have the density for my X, okay? Now, if I apply Bayes' theorem here, then I plug everything in. So I have certain priors here, for example, a half, a half, and I have my Gaussian distribution and I divide by all possibilities, by the evidence, to get the probability of being in a certain class given that I know the location. So now if you do some massaging on these terms here, yeah, then basically you get the one divided by one plus this quotient, okay? Um, so how do you get this one? So I think um, I can derive it for you if you want to. So it's really not difficult. So let me write it like that. So basically the top is, let's call it A, and the bottom is called A plus B. Now, how do I get the A down here? So basically I can say, um, this is the same as one divided by one divided by A times A plus B. Okay, so I've just rewritten the A as one divided by A at the bottom. And then if I multiply it out, I get the one plus B divided by A, okay? Let's check it. So the B term is the one that goes on top and the A term is the one at the bottom. 
So let's check whether that's the case. So the B term is the one with the two and the A term is the one with the one. Okay, so this can be easily derived. So this now looks almost now like our so-called logistic sigmoidal function, where we have an exponential function as well. So let's rewrite this now as an um, exponential function with minus a. And how can we do this? Just by now equating this number with x of minus a. And then that means that the a will be the logarithm of the quotient the other way around. So the minus sign here disappears by flipping between the top part and the bottom part. Okay, so that's why the minus sign is gone. Now, if we now plug everything into this one over here, yeah, so if we plug in our Gaussian distributions, yeah, then we can show that the logarithm of the quotient will be a linear function, okay? So, how can you do it? I show you on the next slide. So, basically, the w can be resolved to be the difference between the means, okay, weighted by the covariance matrix, and the w0, the offset, can be calculated also by basically calculating some norm of the w1 and some norm of the w2 plus the quotient of my priors, okay? So if you plug this expression into this equation, you can derive the logarithm of the quotients of two Gaussians. So why does it work so nicely? I mean, when you take the logarithm of a Gaussian, basically the exponential function goes away and we end up with this polynomial of degree two, okay? So far so good. Um, the logarithm of a quotient turns the quotient into a difference. So we have the difference of two polynomials of degree two, and then we just collect the terms in the right order. Okay, so that's it. You might wonder, so where does the square term go? The square term is at the top and at the bottom. So this x times sigma times x, it is in the p of x given c1, but it's also in the p of x given c2. And that one will cancel out because the sigma is in both terms the same. Okay, so you will have x times sigma inverse times x minus x times sigma inverse times x. And so the term just disappears. And what remains is just a linear expression. So we see that um, this logistic sigmoidal nonlinearity like turns now our linear function like into nice posterior probabilities. Okay, so however, the starting point might be linear regression or logistic regression. And then it falls from the sky that we apply in nonlinearity. However, you could have started with two Gaussians and say, now what is now the, um, basically the probability of being in the other class? And you find out, oh, it's one divided by one plus e to the minus some linear function, okay? Why not fit then the parameters of the linear function directly? So let's see what the meaning of these things are. For example, the meaning of my vector w, it is basically the difference of the two vectors multiplied by this covariance matrix. So let's look at the board, what that means. So that means if I have a covariance matrix being identity, yeah, then the transformation with the identity doesn't change anything. And the w will be just equal to mu2 minus mu1 or the other way around, which is exactly this vector over here. Okay, great. So this is the normal vector to some separating plane. So right now it might be here or wherever the origin is. And with the W0, we can shift this one to the right location. Okay, so it's really intuitively doing exactly what we want, this W. So it's so just a difference between the two means. That's it. Okay. Of course, if your data is nonlinear or more complicated, kind of, it will kind of be an average of the means. So the, again, if you have these banana type of things and the mean might be over here and it still might work quite okay, okay? Since you are looking for the location of the different clusters and the locations are already telling you a lot. The offset W, so that one is computed basically by the norm of the mu, yeah? One and the norm of the mu two, okay? So that's something that I don't find so intuitive, but it follows now from the mass, okay? And also the quotient is influencing my W0, which is interesting. So suppose I say one class is super probable, yeah? So it's, let's say, three quarters, and the probability of C2 is one quarter, yeah? Then this quotient here will be something like logarithm of three, and that would mean that we will shift the decision boundary accordingly, okay? 
So visually, it would mean if this thing has a much larger probability than that one, the decision boundary will be shifted towards the mu2, right? Because why? Because we say this is a much smaller cluster than that one. So we need to shift it over there. So in a way, that also makes sense. Now that here's a logarithm, okay, that's, these kind of things are often surprising, but it's because kind of, okay, the quotient is tel telling us something about the relationship between the two classes. And then with the logarithm, we kind of getting it on the right scale, okay? So to, on the right unit so that we can use it for the offset, right, in the space. That's often the case. Good, so far so good. So we see now single layer network, yeah? It's basically now, we can have it as a linear discriminant where we apply some sigmoid. And then if we do that, the Y of X can be interpreted as the posterior probabilities, okay? Which is quite nice. So now how powerful are these kind of linear discriminants? Oh, I see here's a typo. So there's an N missing, I should change that. So are there any limitations for classifiers like that? And as you know already, we've seen this in um, the support vector machine thing. There are of course already in 2D there are already situations that cannot be solved with a linear decision boundary, okay? So um, basically uh, there's a famous XOR problem. So where I'm having two classes that are like located like an XOR. And now you might wonder, so what is it, what is this true, false? What does it have to do with Boolean function? So basically by saying the one being equal to true, okay, and let's say the minus one being equal to false. And then here again, we have a true, and again here we have a false. So now the X or basically means X or of one axis and the other axis is only one of them can be true, right? And if both of them are true, then the whole thing is false. Or if both of them are false, the whole thing is also false. So it's only true for one of them being true. That's the XOR. And of course, you can also generalize it to arbitrarily many dimensions. Now, would suppose we would have like a three-dimensional XOR problem. You could think of a cube where at each of the corners, you are kind of flipping the sign of your classification, okay? You start at one corner, say this is plus one, and then you follow one of the edges of the cube to get to one of the other corners. There are three possibilities and they all get a minus sign. And then again, you flip again the sign and so on and so forth. And by this, you could assign to the three, uh, to the eight um, corners of a cube, you could assign these, these labels and that would be the three dimensional XOR problem. And you can generalize it arbitrarily. Now, what's the problem with that one? I draw already a couple of lines. Intuitively, they are the coordinate axis. But what would be a classification boundary? Can I draw a straight line through this to perfectly classify this? Unfortunately not. So if I take a straight line to have the minus ones on this side, I'm having maybe the plus on the correct side, but there are some pluses that are on the wrong side. So no matter how I put a straight line through this, I cannot classify it, okay? So this is a serious limitation, but let's talk about the story again. So you start with single cells, in a brain, right? And we know the brain is complicated and there are lots of them, right? They are not only single cells in one layer, but they are multiple layers. However, the criticism here against this linear discriminant thing is for a single cell basically saying, okay, the single cell cannot do the XOR problem. Wow, this must be really bad. So the criticism that it has limitations here in 2D or in higher D is not really super valid, right? I mean, we are using a very simple model right now and of course, by combining many of them, kind of, we can overcome all these models. We've seen already by combining several neurons, we get very Voronoi type shelf, um, complicated classification boundaries. So it's imaginable that by looking at more complicated function, combining this simple idea and stacking it on top of each other, we can solve these problems, okay? Mathematically speaking, or in terms of statistical learning theory, which is another topic that we will look at in one of the lectures, we could say the wapnik shervonenkis dimension of a linear classifier in two dimensions is only three. So that basically should translate it for you. If my data is in two dimensions, it means I can only correctly classify three data points. Yeah, so that means if I have three data points, I can now arbitrarily assign labels to them, for example, like this, and a linear classifier can perfectly classify that, okay? 
So it doesn't matter what labels I put here, I can always draw a straight line, which is kind of perfectly classifying this stuff. However, if I have four data points, now in general position in 2D, I can have an assignment where my linear discriminant classifier cannot solve it anymore, okay? And that basically says, so the VC dimension of the linear classifier is three. Whatever that is, that is the definition, by the way. That's it, right? So you look for these data points and you need to count um, how many data points can I put here yeah, such that my model class still can do it. Of course, suppose now you allow also curves like a kernel function or something, then you could, for example, have a parabola shape or something like this for one class and the other class will be the outside. So like a parabola shape or like an ellipsoidal shape will have a much higher VC dimension, okay? We will see later. The statistical learning theory is like a um, very mathematical, very theoretical approach trying to understand the limit of learning, right? Of learning in computers. And um, it is very theoretical and the results are very abstract, but they give us some interesting tools to talk about these things. For example, they allow us now to say, okay, the VC dimension of a linear classifier is three. So we cannot solve the XOR problems. It's obvious that we can't do it, okay? It's, but it's not a bad thing. It just means that the capacity of a single layer network is very limited. Yeah? So it cannot approximate all possible function. Um, now, how can we make it more powerful? Of course, we know the trick already from linear regression and here it comes again. Yeah? So we had it in linear regression that we introduced these basis functions. And that was also the foundation for the kernel methods. So let's use them here as well. So instead of applying now our weights directly to the axis, let's have some basic basis functions. They are also called features sometimes. Yeah. And of course, we should have one phi sub zero of x that is equal to one, because then we can get rid of the threshold or the bias, right? The bias term we want to include here. So there should be one basis function, which is constant one, so that we can use this nice notation. But um, in general, they can now calculate more complicated features. So each of these basis functions takes a whole vector in, okay? So now how powerful is this? What are the limitations there? Actually now with the right basis function, I can approximate any function in the continuous space arbitrarily well. So just for intuition, so why is that the case? Suppose for example, these um, basis functions are polynomials of increasing degree, right, of these things. Then think of a Taylor expansion being an approximation, right, to any of possible functions. Well, another way to, to think about the basis function is Fourier transforms, okay? So also with the Fourier transform, you can approximate every function arbitrarily well, okay? So the surprising thing is that with countably many basis function, you can approximate all possible functions in continuous space. So that's like an interesting theorem that can be proven, but it helps us here kind of to see that now this is a much more powerful representation. Um, and actually we can also solve the XOR problem now. In 2D, the solution looks like this. We just take a single basis function, yeah, where the basis function is just an X taking X1, X2 in 2D, and we just multiply the two numbers, right? And then this is now a single feature which is calculating exactly what we need to solve the, this XOR problem. So why does it work? Because two positive numbers gives you something positive and two negative numbers give you also something positive, okay? So it's just like tuned towards the XOR problem. Of course, in principle, this is like the XOR function in a way, this taking this product, right? So we are feeding it into it. However, nonetheless, it shows that maybe we can learn this file automatically. And so um, by having these basis functions now, there's no limit anymore towards this one. Okay, now how can we now learn from data? And this looks a bit complicated because I'm again using a different notation. So this is the notation of Chris Bishop's book that I'm following here. So if you open Chris Bishop's book, you should be fine with it. And I think you've seen it so often you will quickly understand what I mean. So let me explain to you. So here we are using the index indices on the top right to denote the data point index, okay? So the n training data is indexed by x to the one to x to the capital N, okay? So this is not exponentiation. This is just indexing the data. So why am, are they doing this? Because sometimes they want to talk about the 
nth data point, but then of the case coordinate, okay? And to avoid like double indexing like down there. So this is a good choice for this idea here. Then they are having targets and the way they have these targets here is that they have this one hot encoding, okay? So basically the targets T are also vectors of length C, which is the number of classes, okay? And one of them is one and the other one is zero. So you see, basically the ideas are always the same. It's the same like in k-means, how we wrote stuff up and it's uh, the same in, in, yeah, in typically deep learning where you've heard something about um, one hot encoding. Um, however, the only difficulty is often the notation, that the notation is changing in every publication. People are using a new notation because it's more convenient for the particular thing they are talking about. But this shouldn't like um, confuse you. However, during the lecture, of course, for me, it's more convenient to use all these different notations because then I can closely follow, for example, to the notes from a book or from some publication or something. And it prepares you, okay, also to be a bit robust against the notation. So now we are using the so-called least square technique. That's how Chris Bishop is using it. So what do we want? We want to have the output to mimic the targets, okay? So we say, let's take the least square of it. So we sum up over all possible classes where only one of them will be one and all the others are zero. So for a given location X, N, I want to have the output of my network. So the different nodes at the output, they should mimic this one hot encoding. So the output shouldn't be too large, right? It shouldn't be too small. It should be just right. So you should hit the one for the correct class and you should hit zeros for the wrong classes and you average over all possible data points. Now, of course, I can plug it in, the definition for the y sub k, and I'm getting this triple summation here, which looks a bit intimidating, but this is just written out, and it's always the same like we've seen before. Now, when you see sum of squared errors, basically, um, yeah, this should ring a bell and should tell you, okay, it's like assuming like a Gaussian noise model on the data, kind of, right? So somehow there must be a Gaussian. Um, if you're a numerics person, you say, yeah, the squared function has nice properties. Okay, it's differentiable everywhere. So that's good for optimization. And it's kind of saying, if I'm a little bit wrong, it doesn't matter so much. And if I'm a lot wrong, then you pay a lot, right? I mean, that's just the shape of the squared function of the, the parabola, right? So the parabola is saying, so right here, we are super happy. We hit the zero. But if we are a little bit off, yeah, we don't care very much. So the values here are all very small at this bottom area. However, if you're further away, then you pay a lot and you pay much more maybe than linear. This is in contrast to like the L1 norm, which would look like this, where you also for very small values, you would still try to get closer to the zero, okay? Because you are only at the zero when you're really at the zero. For such a um, parabola, basically, if we are close to zero, we are fine. So this sum of squared error, that's just the way to fit a function. And we know you can derive from a Gaussian, but let's look now what's happening here. So just take the derivatives of this error function with respect to the weights. And here now it's, I didn't write it out with matrix differential calculus, just the plain um, partial derivative with respect to one of the entries. And notice the WKJ has two indices. So one for each class and one for each input. Okay, so the W is basically a matrix which is connecting each of the input nodes with each of the output nodes. Yeah, and when you go through the mass, this squared up here cancels against the one half. The summation can be dragged out for the N being equal to one. The summation for the K being equal to one to C will vanish for all terms but for the case term, so that's why the summation is gone. And then we have the summation here, um, still having the same expression in here. That's because we have a squared function and derivative of a squared function is basically um, the, uh, the same function where the squared is removed, which is just the summation times the inner derivative. So this is basically now the function without the squared, so just copied. And then I need to calculate the inner derivative where I'm with my j now selecting the j summon from the inner summation and taking the coefficient in front of the wkj, which is just the phi sub j. Okay, so I, I hope this is reasonably simple for you. 
This can be nicely rewritten by rewriting now this difference between like our output output um, nodes and the target by the this new letter R sub K to the end, which is also called the residual. Okay, so that is basically like the difference that we have. And then the formula is quite simple. Now, when you think about it, so what does it mean, this formula here? Okay, basically you're summing up over all data points, fine, okay, so you're collecting the different information that you get from the different data points. And now how much is your weight updated? So if the residual is very large, okay, then basically you get a very large update. The residual also tells you the direction of the update, right? So if this Y is much larger than the targets, yeah, then basically you will increase uh, the W, oh, then you will decrease the W since we are doing gradient descent, we will subtract the gradient. So that basically means if the residual is very large, that means the Y is very large, we will decrease the corresponding W, which of course then decreases the Y and vice versa. Similarly, if you have a feature which is super important, yeah, it has a big impact in the summation with these weights, then these weights, they get also penalized a lot or increase a lot, okay? So also the interpretation of this expression here kind of makes sense. So important features which are large, they lead to large changes in the W and it also is now modulated with the residuals, okay? So that is the interpretation of this formula. So for a single data point, of course, the summation just disappears and we can formulate the so-called stochastic gradient descent method. So what is the stochastic gradient descent method? So now maybe um, many of you have seen this already. Uh, let me tell you what you're doing. So suppose you have lots of example points. Instead of calculating the gradient for all example points, you're only calculating for a single data point, okay? And then for the single data point, you're doing an update. Let me contrast this to the batch gradient descent method. So there are two methods that can be used for gradient descent, the batch gradient descent and the stochastic gradient descent. So let's look at the differences. In the batch gradient descent, we're having a summation over all gradients, so over all data points, and in the stochastic gradient descent, we randomly select one data point. Now you might ask, so why on earth would you ever do the, batch, uh, the stochastic gradient descent? It looks like a big mistake kind of to randomly take points and then to do the updates. We should average, <coughs> of course, the gradients and then kind of getting the right, <coughs> excuse me, getting the right direction. Um, let me get a glass of water. <coughs> Okay, sorry for the interruption. Okay, so why on earth would you do this random thing like jumping around and then doing these updates instead of always the averaging? So the averaging is kind of like you smoothly, every, every point has a contribution and you kind of smoothly um, average over those to update your weights, right? So this looks much more reasonable. However, when we look at the price, how expensive it is, it would be at the beginning, maybe we have a randomly initialized W, okay, and we want to update it. So basically at the beginning, the W is just calculating garbage, okay? So let's calculate the garbage for all our data points. So we have to iterate over all data set, let's say 60,000 MNIST examples, and we, are, have to, we have to do this calculation 60,000 times, and then we average the gradients and we do a single update step. And then we say, okay, now it's improved a little bit, let's do it again. And again, you iterate over all 60,000 examples with your still mediocre W to calculate another update. Let's look at the other one. Here we only require one sixty thousandth of the computation time to get away from our crappy W. However, we are only trying to improve one single data point. So there's now one single data point that is pushing around the W. So we see um, that now if I'm having this summation of 60,000 examples, it corresponds to 60,000 updates to my W. So in the batch gradient descent, I'm having a very smooth update with a very knowledgeable gradient that looked at all data point. However, I'm very slow in computing it. Instead here, I'm having already 60,000 updates 
and I can already move towards the right solution. So typically the stochastic gradient descent is much faster than the batch gradient descent, okay? So as an image, maybe approximately, let's say at the beginning, This is our data set and let's say our first crappy estimate at the beginning is this straight line here, okay? So everything is kind of wrong. So I could of course now average for these data points and average for those data points. And this will now tell me, okay, you should move your line a little bit like that then the mistakes are slightly smaller, okay? And this is like 60,000 iterations. So this is like a for loop with 60,000 examples. And then again, yeah, another 60,000 examples. So that would be batch, yeah. Let's take another example. Let's say we have as a starting point over here and we do now a stochastic gradient descent. Yeah, then maybe we get a kind of weird update, yeah, which might not be perfect, but it only requires one computation. And then we might do a super noisy another one, which looks like this now. It's a bit more crazy. Yeah, and another one, a bit more crazy, but we can do, we only require one step. So this is one, two, three, four, and we are already much closer than the data than after 122,000 evaluations, okay? So this thing is typically going much faster. I mean, in particular at the beginning, when this plane is very far away, from far away, these points, they look the same anyway, so it doesn't matter which one I choose. So all of them will help me getting close to the data. Similarly, so they, they also look almost yeah, the same, right? So it doesn't matter which of one I'm, I'm choosing. So the average probably doesn't make a big difference here. So the big difference here is instead of having an expensive, very good gradient, you take a very coarse, very crappy gradient but you evaluate it very, very often, okay? So that's basically the idea. However, nonetheless, when you look at modern deep learning code, so why are people still using batch gradient descent even though it's so expensive? That's because on a GPU, on a graphics processing unit, you have a parallel computer, yeah? And you can run a single update as fast as you can run a hundred updates, okay? So basically a GPU is a parallel computer that can run the same code let's say a hundred times in parallel, and it costs as much as to run it one time on a CPU. Okay, if you have such great hardware, then you can have a compromise. So you don't take all data, so the full batch here, the N, but you tune the size of the batch in such a way that your GPU is using all its cores, all its power basically, right? And then in one iteration, you can move 100 data points through your GPU and you get like an, yeah, a reasonable gradient that is, has some smoothing properties, right? That is not completely weekly, but you are, you are not paying the super high price of going through the whole data set. So with parallel computers, you typically take a, um, yeah, like a trade-off between the extreme, one extreme where you only have one data point and the other extreme where you take all data points, okay? So that is stochastic and gradient descent. And I think on this slide, we didn't forget anything. Okay, so far so good. So this is how the stuff is typically trained. Um, so far so good, or any questions up to here? I hope it's all simple and easy. Yeah, and I think it is, okay? Good. Let's look at an early single layer network, the so-called perceptron. And there's some, some friends which, which look very similar, the so-called ADA lines. So from 1962, from Frank Rosenblatt, he invented the so-called perceptron for the two-class problem, and it looks very much like the thing that we've just seen, okay? So basically, he's really doing this um, linear combination of features, yeah, where he implemented the features. I show you how they look, the implementation of the features in a second, and then he passed it through some nonlinearity. In this case, the nonlinearity is just a sign function. So it's just looking whether the whether the number that comes out is positive or negative. And as we know, that's fine, right? So that's fine for a two-class problem. Now, how does the training update look like? So the perceptron criterion here, yeah, it's, it's not really the gradient of some loss function or something. It's more something that you intuitively write down, 
So I, we can't ask Mr. Rosenblatt anymore. I think he died in 1971 or something like this, quite too early. Um, but this formula to me looks a bit like it like intuitively makes super sense and he tried it and it works. So let's look at how it works. So basically here again, we see the W transpose times phi of X is calculating basically the value, the output value for one of the outputs or for the single output that we have here. So the um, what we want to minimize is that we want to minimize this output values for the wrong examples. So the summation here goes only over the wrong examples where we basically have a disagreement between our target value and the output of our neural network. And so basically where um, when we have a very large value for a wrong example, yeah, we want to make it smaller. Okay, so now this smaller now is modulated by multiplying it with the target, where the target is plus one or minus one. So basically for the plus examples, yeah, it means that if I'm, if I'm classified wrong, it means that the output of the perceptron was a negative number, okay? And so this negative number should get smaller. So this negative number gets multiplied by minus, so it gets a positive number, and then it should get smaller, okay? So by this, basically it's less wrong on this wrong example. If you take a negative example, then basically the t here is a minus one, and it cancels with the minus one over here, and it says that Unfortunately, it was a negative example, but the output of my perception was a large positive number. Please make it smaller as well, okay? So the clever thing here is by multiplying it here with the targets, kind of we're having this single criterion for both classes. Actually, the idea is very much the same as we had when we wrote down the support vector machine. There we had these constraints and we were multiplying them with the y sub i where the y sub i was either plus one or minus one depending on the on the target, okay? And this is basically using the same trick. Good. Um, curiously, so Frank Rosenblatt, I think, is Cornell University. Cornell University is East Coast, okay? And if there's East Coast, there's also always West Coast. And at the West Coast, there's Vidro and Hoff, right? And they did something very similar, like at a very similar time, right? They definitely worked, I guess they have worked independently. They are also different communities, but they came up with very similar approaches. Um, maybe I should, should look up again about Vidro and Hoff, what was their motivation. But I think by training, I think Professor Vidro, he's a professor at the um, electrical engineering department of Stanford. So he's an electrical engineer, okay? So he's interested in circuits, in um, whatever, receiver, amplifier, and all of this. And then he came up with Mr. Hoff, some adaptive electronics that kind of adaptively learn something about the world. That is super fancy. And it's basically the same thing as the perceptron from Frank Rosenblatt, who's by training, I think is a psychologist who's interested in red brains and in these kind of things. So he, I think he's a neuroscience person, if I recall right, but you should look it up on the Wikipedia pages. So coming more from the neuroscience side, trying to rebuild the brain basically, okay? But they came up with very similar ideas. Here are more nice images. And as always, I'm always surprised. So these researchers here, they're wearing ties. I mean, I'm also wearing a shirt, so that's already quite fancy. They, of course, both wear shirts and it's in Cali, no, it's not in California, it's on the East Coast, so it's a short leaf. So what are they working on here? So the description on this image is that they are working on a prototype association unit for the first perceptron. So this prototype association unit, so this is their code, okay? They're using electronics for this mathematical equation. So they wrote down a mathematical equation, but then they sort of stuff together, okay? So they're creating a circuit that should learn. Imagine how powerful they would have been if they would have had like NumPy or Python, right? Just running it as code. They don't have to implement it with hardware. They just implement it and they could run it on their cell phones, their experiment. So I'm always imagining these kind of super clever guy who came up with these ideas. What would have they come up if they would have the powers that we have? Okay, and then finally, what does it tell us, right? We have all these powerful things. So let's have great ideas, right, of this quality. But of course, on these kind of slides, you only see the lucky guys, right? As you know, it takes 20, 20 ideas to have one good idea, right? So, and that's also with researchers. It takes 20, 20 researchers to have one 
Yeah, so 20 very good researchers to get like one researcher who has a really good idea that kind of takes off. Okay, so that's, and you don't know beforehand. You cannot know beforehand. Okay, so this is another image that you find when you search for the perceptron. And I try to find images which I can use in my slide. So this is from the Digital Library of Cornell and I hope I'm allowed to use this for fair use. So this is this Mark I perceptron. So Mark I is one of the earliest computers and it was like these super big machines, right? That were like in like big rooms and it were taking lots of powers and then had the power of like a, a little IC, like an integrated circuit at the end, right? So, and you see all these, these wiring and stuff and this, I don't know what, what part of the perceptron algorithm this kind of wiring is, but it looks quite fancy. And this is not like a little piece here. So you could stand here, so that's like two meters high, this thing. So it's really complicated. Um, here's another image and actually this is a drawing from a book, Perceptron. Do I have it here, the book? No, I don't have it here. So where do I have it? Um, so it's a book, Perceptrons, which I talk a little bit more about it, but it's a nice drawing how this Perceptron of Rosenblatt worked. So basically you had like a digital camera type of thing. So you had like these photoreceptive sensors, probably with a lens, and then you had like these big errors of these like light sensitive electronic elements and you kind of was was connecting several of those together and feeding them into this feature extractor phi of phi 2 okay so kind of here there's some processing happening and at the end everything is summed up to get the output so when you look at this this looks like the retina and i think that the motivation for building this thing was the retina so here you are trying to create an electronic circuit with soldering that can do something that the brain can do okay and then playing around with it um when you look at the authors of this book perceptrons it's marvin minsky and simon peppard where simon peppard i think is also a psychologist and marvin minsky is also one of the, the great AI researchers of the last century, um, I must say. And it's a book from 1969. And they were wondering about the limits of the perceptron. So Marvin Minsky was not famous for neural network, but he was more famous for logical AI. So at that time, like in the end of the 60s, um, there were like these different schools in artificial intelligence. So everybody was maybe talking about it like today, but there were these people who were more coming from mathematics and they were saying, we need logic to do AI, okay? So we have to write formulas, not only for vector spaces and for what, whatever math topic you like, topology, but we should write down formulas for everyday stuff, right? So if it takes, if it rains, takes the umbrella. If whatever that happens, do this. And to try to write out mathematical rules for common sense reasoning. And another one is John McCarthy, who's also like on the mathematics side of artificial intelligence. Again, John McCarthy, West Coast, Stanford, and Marvin Minsky, MIT, that's East Coast, okay? So there are often these, these two poles. And there are these AI people who say, if you want to reach AI in the next five years, yeah, so from 1970 to 1975, the funding should go into the logical AI stuff, okay? Then there are other people like Rosenblatt and Vidro and Hoff and the connectionist. So the connectionist, they try to connect the pieces, so the, the wires together to get like a brain-like structure. And they say, no, we shouldn't go from mathematics and, and use that one to trying to build AI. We should try to rebuild the brain. So we should study the brain and then we rebuild it. And then we have AI. Okay, so that's a completely different approach to artificial intelligence, a connectionist approach. And I think Minsky was convinced that the connectionist approach is wrong, okay? And that's why he wrote the book Perceptrons, where he draws this little image, and then a couple of pages later, he's mathematically proving that this perceptron is super limited in its capabilities, okay? And by this kind of bashing, the connectionist movement, and actually the neural networks, they disappeared for quite a while in the 70s, okay? I think the 70s were more about logical AI and these kind of things. You can also see this from popular music, uh, not music, but from popular movies. Yeah, there's 1969. What movie comes to mind when you think about it? It's 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's the movie you definitely want to watch, okay? And when you watch this movie, watch closely when Dave is switching off HAL 9000, the computer. So it's taking out all these modules 
And there are different modules and one is called the logic module, for example. And there's no neural network module. There's also no deep learning module. They are having more this logical kind of brain, okay? So, and I think Marvin Minsky was one of the, um, uh, one of the advisors for the movie even, okay? So there's no connectionist idea, I think, in Hell 9000, okay? So it's like a purely logical device. And it's interesting how we can see it even in these movies. Um, this is different when you look at other popular movies where, where some of the AIs that are running around are more having like some neuronal structure, maybe with some green blood or something weird or something happening, more looking a little bit more biological. Yeah? So there are different ideas how to reach artificial intelligence. So here comes the limit now that the Minsky and Pepper people say. They say it, it can solve the EXO problem, okay, with the appropriate choice of phi. Okay, acknowledged, so that's okay. However, um, we have these receptive fields here, so they are kind of limiting the diameter of these fields that one of these things can process, okay? And so we cannot solve so certain connectivity problems, okay? So I will show you an image of these connectivity problems and we can look at them, how difficult they are. And Minsky and Pepper were able to prove mathematically that this kind of setup cannot solve these problems, okay? And then they say, so how on earth could this be useful for artificial intelligence if they cannot solve simple problems, okay? So let's fund and let's go more into logical AI research, okay? I mean, I'm not saying Minsky and Pepper were bad people or something. They were just fighting on the best ideas, right? And they were truly believing that um, the logical approach is kind of the right approach. I think the Wikipedia page says that later on, they were also building on the perception and also using neural networks, right? So you can always revise your ideas at that. So let's look at, at limits of um, neural networks. So here's the first limit. So here you are the neural network and here's a task for you. You should look at the image and see whether there's a tiger or not, okay? So was it a tiger or not, right? I, I show it again, okay? So it was very quick. So did you see the tiger? I didn't see it. Actually, there is no tiger, but there's a cheetah and a gazelle running around, right? That we haven't seen if we just look at it. But that's typically how we implement a neural network, right? You give it an image once, it should do its forward processing and it should answer it. So for, to intelligence, there's much more, right? When we look at this image, we look around. Okay, here's the horizon. This is some grass, okay. Ah, we see the gazelle here and we see it's running. And from the direction of the running, our eye immediately follows. So where is it running from? It's it's running, uh, there's a cheetah following it, right? And maybe, I'm not sure who's faster. So probably both are super fast animals. And so when we look at this image, there's like a lot of reasoning going on when we're trying to understand this picture. So there's like, we can orient our attention to one of the pieces and then look around to look for other pieces. So the processing is super complicated, definitely much more complicated than just having like a single layer with some receptive fields and then combining it and summing everything up and then needing to decide. We have lots of levels of processing going on in our brains. Okay, let's get to the problem that um, Minsky and Peppert were pointing out for the perceptrons. So this is a book from them. It has this nice cover and um, the, 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 the outcome is that the diameter limited perceptron, okay, so with diameter limited, I mean, so the uh, a single feature can only look at a certain region of the screen and not at the full screen, okay? So the diameter limited perceptron cannot solve the connectivity problem, okay? So what is the connectivity problem? Yeah, that's a super simple problem of deciding whether this is one red line or whether those are two red lines, okay? And let me tell you, one of them is one red line and the other one is two red line. However, can you solve it? So I can't. This is super tough, right? Can you do it? I mean, it's just by looking at it. I can't do it. So when I want to solve it, how do I solve it? Let me follow with my mouse one of these red things and then let's see where we end up. Okay, we're going like this and then we go like that and we end up to the other side. So that means the bottom one is one red line and the top one is two red lines. So for me, this is not so compelling that this is really a problem of the perceptron, right? I mean, I also can't do it. 
I also have to focus on one location and I need, have to use my higher reasoning kind of like following a line and then remembering, okay, my starting point was this, the other one was that one. However, of course, if you view this one like as a bitmap with zeros and ones, you can write down a logical formula for this that decides whether they are split or separate. I'm sure one can do it, right? So there, there's probably some logical mathematics found, um, mathematics defined solution towards this one. However, so for me, this is not surprising that a neural network cannot do it. It has like a limited focus here, right? So it, it needs to process this local stuff and actually no matter where you look, it looks always the same, right? So this, whether it's like connected or not, that's like a macroscopic property of these images. And with these typical processing that's going on here, you're more locally looking. However, when you look at an image and you should decide whether there's a, um, whether there's a panda bear on it or something, then you're also looking around and you're looking for the fur features and you may be looking for bumbles and you may be looking for this and that. So you're also having these local stuff that you're kind of connecting, okay? So these global things, whether it's solvable or not, it's a difficult, complicated thing. And I'm sure HAL 9000 looks at it and with a snap knows which is connected and not, okay? And HAL 9000, I think, doesn't use neural networks. Okay, how can we generalize now our single layer network? So far, so good. I mean, I talked already quite a lot and we are still with the single layer. So let's move on to multi-layer networks. So um, this activation is not the whole point here, but the whole point here is now that we make these feature functions adaptive as well, okay? And now we are not only learning like the overall network with the linear discriminant, but let's also learn these features, okay? So instead of having hardwired features, why not learn them themselves with other single layer networks, okay? So let's write this down. Let's use a slightly different notation. So here's our first multi-layer network. And let me also try to draw something on the board for this one. So here the X goes in, gets linearly combined. I calculate some nodes on it with plus some bias, and then I apply another nonlinearity. I show you a picture in a second. And then this thing here is basically now my new features. Okay, so those are the files. And those files are now fed into the rest of the network where the outer activation here, I omitted it, which is often the case that one omits the outer activation. So the idea going from single layer to multi-layer is basically now replacing these feature functions with networks themselves. So since those are neural networks, let's draw a little network image for those. but let's abstract already a little bit. So basically I'm having here my input x1, x2, for example. Those are my nodes. And now I'm calculating some intermediate representation, z1, z2, z3. I'm free to choose how many I want, okay? And basically now, let me draw it with a trapezoid, okay? Everyone is connected with everyone else. Now, what is the formula here? So here's my x. And the Z is now a combination already. It's a tangent superbolicus of W times X, okay, plus, plus an offset. Do I have an offset here? Okay, here again I have an offset, okay? So plus some offset. So that would be a formula for this block here. And then I'm doing yet another one. And let's say whatever, what do I want? Let's say I want to have four outputs. which would then be um, the y is equal to w times z plus b. Okay, now I have to be careful. So this is b1, so this is w1, and this is w2, and this is b2. Okay, now we have a multi-layer neural network, okay? Input layer, this is a hidden layer, and this is the output layer, okay? So far, so simple. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Let's see, does perceptron mean anything? Uh, yeah, perceptron is typically the, the word, perceptron is about perception, right? Perception in German, erkennen or something. Typically, perceptron, perception is related to um, computer vision or to vision, right? So that you see something. So I'm perceiving the world with my eyes. So I think that's a well-formed sentence using the word perception, okay? And now, 
Perception is like the cognitive science or the psychologist's description of using your senses. And then the perception yeah, with the O-N at the end, that's like an artificial machine, which is also trying to do perception. Okay, so that's where the perception is coming. Okay, so I don't have another example, but there must be, there, there are probably other examples for, with the O-N at the end. Okay, so that is now a representation of a multi-layer perception. Um, no, multi-layer network, sorry. Let, let's use now this word. The perception is typically reserved for Rosenblatt's um, Rosenblatt's classifier. So these things are often, um, are maybe not, yeah, okay, the M MLP. So we are using the multi-layer perception. So that's a word that is commonly used, okay? So in a way, this is the multi-layer perception, okay? So the perception, the original one is a single layer one. And if I'm also having the features with perception, then I'm having a multi-layer perception, okay? And just that we are here with the words, so the MLPs, the multi-layer perception, that's typically one where we have a fully connected layers where everyone is connected with everyone else. And the CNN, the convolutional neural networks, which we will see later, yeah, they are basically using a convolutional matrix over here. Okay, so that's like the wording. But that the MLP always refers to fully connected. I learned it only like two months ago. So that's some new thing for me too. So I use MLP usually for everything that neural networks are, but I think often MLPs are used for exactly these things that I've written down here. Good, so far so good. Um, we can also have two hidden layers, of course, right? So why not? Why not? I mean, we can just plug this output of this Y into another layer, right? And then we would have yet another one, right? And there you see it that deep learning is not far, right? So you can have as many layers as you want. However, of course, that's already something that the people in the 90s also knew that you can stack them on top of each other and everything is great. However, the training was not working so well. And so there are some problems with the training. And um, the most prominent one that you didn't have enough data in the 90s, okay? Then like 2010, 2011, people came up with some interesting pre-training strategies that were also able kind of to pre-train deeper networks and giving them like a good starting point then for the real training. And by this, people were able to train much deeper networks than in the 90s, okay? Afterward, then five years later, the pre-training is gone again and we just train with the same algorithms like in the 90s, but on bigger data sets, on bigger computers and everything is fine, okay? So deep learning is basically exactly this, what I just showed you, but in many variations. But the basic idea are these ones. So with other words, these um, multi-layer networks or the multi-layer perceptron or these neural networks, they are just stacked logistic regressions, okay? You're just stacking regression on top of each other, having one non-linearity in between. There will be an exercise. I think what's happening, if you don't have a tongue and superbolicus in here, so why do you need this non-linearity here? At the beginning, we motivated it by saying, okay, it gives us a nice interpretation to these things. Then these things can be interpreted like probabilities, but it was for the SIG model function. The tangent superbolicus is a function for minus one to plus one. However, if you omit these things, so what will happen, everything will collapse and you can combine the W3 with the W2 and you get a new offset B3 plus W3 times B2 and the W3 will merge with the W2 and with the W1. So the whole thing is just a linear function. So if you don't have these non-linearities in between here, then the whole thing is, a non, is just a linear function because if you combine two linear functions with each other, it is a linear function. Okay, what other activation units are, uh, functions are there? So there's a sigmoid function, which is typically written as sigma of something. It's one divided by one plus e to the minus a. So since those are like essential, let's plot them. And as I said already, so the, the sigmoid pops up naturally when you assume you have two Gaussians. And if you draw it, it will look like this. So it will cross right at the 0.5, okay? And it will never reach, so this is sigma of A, 
it will never reach zero, so it's always positive. So it's nicely between one and zero. And it's like nice and smooth. So why is nice and smooth nice? Because we want to calculate derivatives and we want to do optimization. So we want to have differentiable functions. Um, what else can you say? So why does it have this shape? So let's try to understand from the expression. So it's e to the minus a. Okay, so let's try to understand it. Let's plug in um, zero. Then we have e to the zero. e to the zero is one. So we have one divided by two. It's a half. If a is going to infinity, yeah, then we have e to the minus infinity will be zero. So the whole thing is equal to one. If we go to minus infinity, it's like e to the infinity. It's like one divided by infinity, and that goes to zero. Okay. So that's the reason why it has this shape. So what other functions are they? So I showed you already the tangent hyperbolicus, and there's something new that I learned today. So I looked it up on Wikipedia and got this expression with these exponential functions, which I knew already, because that one you use sometimes when you calculate the derivative of this tangent superbolicus thing, right? So the tangent superbolicus thing, it has something to do with triangles with the right angle, right? But I couldn't draw here where the tangent superbolicus is, right? I, I know that this is like the sine and here's the cosine. And so they are like, like certain... Is it right? Yeah, I think approximately it's right. I think if this is a unit circle, uh, my drawing is, I think, quite crappy. Let me draw it again. So there's this unit circle. And then I have a certain triangle in here, okay? And then there's one is cosine, the other one is the sine. The quotient is the tangent. And there's somewhere also the tangent superbolicus. Okay, so there's a drawing where you can look at to see the tangent superbolicus. However, I also like this, um, this formulas with the exponentials. And then I was surprised that you can also write it as one minus two divided by one plus x, two x, because this form looks very much like the sigmoid, right? So, and if you think about it, what I remembered of the tangent superbolicus is that it's going from minus one, crossing at zero, and then going to the other one. So this is tangent hyperbolicus, but I didn't know exactly how it compares with the sigmoidal one. So why do people like the tangent hyperbolicus? Because it's a bit more symmetric, right? It's between minus one and one, and the zero here is kind of weird, right? When you multiply something with zero, it cancels out, so it, you, you destroy something. In particular, if you have a neural network, then somehow then information is not passed on. It's like setting a way to zero, right? Suppose you have some inner unit that has calculated a sigmoidal unit and unfortunately you had a large negative number. From that on, you will pass a, a zero and it's like setting the following way to zero as well. So that's kind of weird. So then if you have a large negative number with the tangent superbolicus, kind of you are getting like a negative number, like a minus one, and that's information that is passed on. So to me, like this tangent superbolicus is like, it's more natural. When you look at the expression, again, um, you could understand it by, um, by looking at this. So if x is going to infinity, right, then e to the infinity is infinity. You have 2 divided by infinity, which is 0. But you have 1 minus is 0, so it will go to 1. Okay. And similarly, if you go to minus infinity, then basically e to the minus infinity, um, it will be zero. So you have two divided by one, but you have one minus two, and then you get a minus one. Okay, so also from this formula, you can read off really nicely kind of the shape. I think we also get the zero when we have e to the zero, we have one. So two divided by two is one, minus one is zero. Okay, so everything works out. And the shapes here are very similar, right? It's just there's a factor of two here involved. But apart from that, the sigmoid and the tangent superbolicus are really very similar. Okay, in deep learning, yeah, a very popular nonlinearity is that one, which is like the simplest possible. It's just a maximum function of zero and a, okay? So let me draw it in here. Like that the, the, the most simple version is just zero and then it goes up like a linear function. And of course it's a linear, it's a nonlinear function, right? I mean, it's linear over here, it's linear over there, but it's not linear over at the, at the corner. And as it turns out, that is a very popular choice. 
like um, for, for many classification problems in um, deep learning. And it looks like it learns very well. And as far as I know, that's an invention of the current century. So this stuff is from the previous century. This one is something recent, something new, okay? Good, the key thing here is that they are always nonlinear. If they are not nonlinear, then the whole network will collapse to a single linear layer, okay? And everything is boring. The other thing is it's always a component wise function. So the way I wrote it was for a scalar, right? So how is it applied here in, in such an expression? I mean, the B1 could be a vector and the W1 times X could be like a vectorized result. Then the tangent superbolicus is applied to each of the components. So to have it written down once precisely, this component wise really means I have the X1, X2. I'm having a Z1, Z2, Z3. I should get a new chalk. Um, and then I'm calculating component wise the sigma of it, okay, to get the sigma of Z1, sigma of Z2. So why is that? That's a simple way to do it and it makes the derivative simple, right? So this is a scalar function, which is doing something nonlinear, something weird and having a weird derivative maybe, but I only have to apply it on a scalar, okay? So basically the mapping from this vector to that vector, the derivative will be a diagonal matrix, right? Because the variables are not mixed with each other. If I'm going from this 2D to 3D space with my W1 over here, the derivative will be the whole matrix W1. Oh, there's a question. Is there a question? Ah, oh, I didn't, ah, sorry, okay. Ah, so now we have it in all its beauty. So we have a two dimensional vector, we get a three dimensional vector by multiplying with the matrix and then component wise, we are applying the nonlinearity. Okay, so that's very important. And one could reason differently. So that's the simplest way to get a nonlinear function out of this. Okay, of course, I could, combi I could have combined everything and have much more complicated functions. But in a neural network, the idea is the parameters are in the linear part. Yeah, we can have simple derivative, we can do simple derivations, and the nonlinearity is component wise, and that kind of makes the calculations simple. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Let's look at the implementation. So this is my implementation of the forward computation. Yeah, And here I'm using NumPy. Yeah? I have a MATLAB version two, but let's look at the NumPy one. So it's really just doing exactly the right operations. However, now this is not just for having it nicely written out then having one big expression, this is then also useful to calculate derivatives to define all these variables. Because then we could ask, so now what is the derivative of the squared error with respect to the residual? And once we computed that one, we can ask, so now what is the derivative of my error with respect to the y? And then when we have that solution, we can ask, what is the derivative of my error with respect to z3? And so on and so forth. And so for each row, we are using the chain rule. And we will look in that detail next time when we talk about backpropagation. Let me just show you here, if you do this, yeah, then really going backwards through these letters here, I'm getting basically this differential. So I'm having the D of the arrow. I plug it in and I'm getting just R transpose times DR. Then I'm replacing the R with the Y and so on and so forth. Now at this point here, I'm having the differential um, for the B3 and I can just read off the derivative of E with respect to B3, which is just the R, okay? And I can read off the derivative of my error with respect to W3, which in this case will be just R transpose times W3, okay? And then I continue, I plug in for the Z3, I plug in the expression and go on. And then there's something going on with this diag thing here. That's just to write it out precisely. Basically what I've written down here is the derivative or the, the, the uh, that is the um, Jacobian matrix of 
the nonlinearity from here to here. And that can be written as 1 minus z3 times z3. Anyway, this can be derived by really taking the derivative of my exponential functions here. And if you do this, it turns out that the derivative of my tangent superbolicus can be written as 1 minus the tangent superbolicus squared. Yeah? So that's a nice formula. Why? Because to calculate now the derivative, I don't have to do any complicated cal calculation. I just take the z3, which is the output of the tangent superbolicus. Oh, here's some action. I guess you can hear it. So let's implement this. So those are the derivatives, basically. You can read them off from here. And now my forward computation is calculating from the input to the loss. My backward computation is calculating from the loss back to the inputs. And those are basically the implementations now of the gradients. So this is the gradient of the error with respect to W3, the gradient of the error with respect to B2, and so on and so forth. We go into more detail how to compute this, yeah? but the basic idea is I'm going forward through my computation to calculate the output, and then I'm going backward through it to calculate all gradients. Once I have the gradients, now I can do gradient descent, which basically means now updating my parameters. Okay, so I'm just say minus a learning rate times w1e and so on and so forth. So here's the same thing in MATLAB. In MATLAB it looks a little bit nicer. It's exactly the same code as before. Maybe for the outer product in NumPy you prefer this notation which is like a column vector times a row vector and that is the outer product in MATLAB. Okay so there's no notion as a vector. Everything is a matrix. Good. Backpropagation we do next time. We only have two minutes, but let me show you my code. So here's some code where I've now implemented all of this. So let's run it. Oh, question. There's a question in the... Ah, okay. Ah, the Zoom chat. Okay. Sorry. That's missing in my setup. Okay. So let's see. Is sheet nine the last one for this year? No, sheet number, exercise sheet number nine is not the last one for this year. Ah, you mean for this year? Okay. Ah, that's a too difficult question for me. Uh, let me think. No, I don't think so. It doesn't make sense. So if we don't have another sheet, so we will always get a sheet every week. Also the last week before Christmas. Okay. And then if you want to have a Christmas break, yeah, you work until Christmas and then you have your Christmas break. And then the semester begins again and then you continue. And then you will also have, I think, approximately the same number of days for your sheet. Okay. If we do it differently, we will have some em empty, um, empty uh, answering sections and so it, it won't work. So next question. So is it possible to mix activation functions different? Of course, yes, you can freely mix it. You can put whatever you like. You can also invent your own. Okay. Just put them in. But you have to be able to calculate derivatives of it. Next question. Is the x2x right or should it be x2a? Ah, uh, you're very, very right. So that's a typo. So let me show you everyone. Of course, it's wrong. So there must be an A. Thanks for spotting this. Yeah. What else? Kindly switch to the board. Ah, yeah, yeah. That's always, I forgot this always. I believe there will be, yeah, I guess also there will be 12 exercises. Okay, any more questions right now? If not, so next time, please remind me that I um, look more often to the chat or I should, I, I couldn't see it because of the full screen that I now did. Okay, so here's my simple implementation. Yeah, so I'm loading a couple of libraries. Did I load them already? And then again, I'm loading the MNIST digits. It's not that the architecture that I'm proposing here will be super good at the MNIST. It's just that's the code that we used already, right? It's nice to look at them and to plot it. Um, so let's look at the digits. So that's how they look. I mean, you know this already from the other exercises. And here comes now my multi-layer network implementation. Before we go through the initialization, here's the code. And that is exactly the code from the slides. So I iterate over the training set I take a single example, I take a single target, and then I do the forward computation exactly like on the slide, okay? Then I do the backward computation, and I update the gradients. And then from time to time, 
I plot out some error and this number should go down a little bit at least, okay? So now what do I need to initialize? I need to initialize basically my matrices W1, W2, W3 and the bias. And I can choose here the layer sizes. So to be speedy, let's put like small ones here, okay? So the M1, M2 is basically saying, so the first layer is going from my dimensionality, which is 784 for all the pixels of the MNIST to 10. And then I'm going from 10 to 20. And then I'm going from 20 to the number of labels, which is 10. Okay, so those are the dimensions. So let's do the initialization like that. And then I can run the loop. And as you can see, the whole thing goes down. I mean, it's, it's going down a lot at the beginning, the loss. And then after a while, it's like staying down here. And I'm not sure whether it's going anywhere. So I think it should go until 60,000 or so. Okay, once I'm done, I can calculate the confusion matrix. And you might know already the confusion matrix. So why is it so large now? So the confusion matrix, let's divide by, let's divide by um, the number of examples and test. Ah, it's not better. Okay, so it's not looking good. Anyway, I think you get the idea. So the confusion matrix now should tell me, okay, there are 17 examples that are zeros and that have been classified as zeros. Then the next diagonal entry will be this one down here. There are 108 examples which were classified as ones and there are indeed ones. However, when you look at the first row, there are lots of examples which were wrongly classified to be an eight. So lots of the zeros, they went to the eight class. Okay, and so on and so forth. So maybe one should plot this thing. So is it easy to plot? Does it work like this in show? Confusion. Oh yeah, there we have it. So it's not very good yet. Okay, it looks like most of the examples were classified as eight. However, my network was super simple here. I'm using a very small one. Of course, you should increase it and then play around with it to find out and to get a good setup. Okay, so this is like the super basic implementation. Next time I will tell you what backpropagation is. And ideally I show you also basically the same network or a better one in PyTorch. Okay, so that would be now like a fancy toolbox that is doing all of this for us. So what is it doing? You still have to do the forward computation in a way yourself, but then the backward computation you get for free using backpropagation which is also known as automatic differentiation, okay? And then the gradient descent, typically you get also for free by different optimization routines that come with the PyTorch toolbox, okay? So let's look at this next time. So thanks a lot for your attention and we see each other again on Wednesday. Bye-bye.